should be live. Hey, Daniel. Oh, we're live. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man. How's it going? Good. How are you? Ah, I can't complain too loudly. You, uh, you enjoying yourself over there? Uh, as much as I can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As much as this industry will allow us, right? Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Something <Yeah>. in... <laughs> So for welcome everybody. Happy to see you joining us. Um today's gonna be a special edition of the Threat Researchers Live. We and as the slide already indicates and also the title and the announcement, we will cover hacktivism unveiled. So we will go across and above and beneath and to the left and to the right in all the statistics uh, that we gathered from several groups. So we were following about 80 different groups on Telegram. Um, we were tracking their DDoS attacks and we have a period of uh, over two months now of information that we can share. And there's some interesting highlights that came out of this uh, and we we wrote a report, so there's also a report available. I will put the, the link uh, in, in the comment later. So so then you can check the whole report that we wrote up on this. But uh, during this or the rest of this Threat Researchers Live, we're going to talk about the different actors that we're seeing. We're going to talk about the global activity. So what activity are they doing? We're going to do some, going to take some groups and analyze their activities, see on a country level what they are doing. And then Daniel will go in deep or in depth uh, on Op Israel. Uh, it's the 10th anniversary, if I'm not mistaken, of Op Israel. So a yep. good moment to look back before we look forward <laughs> of what's going to happen. Okay, so with that said, let me just close my door. The joys of working in a home <laughs> office sometimes. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I rushed in here and uh, yeah, ju just to be in time, but should have taken two more minutes to close my door before I start the stream. <laughs> I, got, I got a special guest in my studio today. He's just sitting here on his couch staring at me. Hopefully yeah. he doesn't bark anyone anytime soon. <laughs> anyway, we can always make it into a short, you know. We have a habit of doing that now. We take two hours of stream and then we just make shorts out of it. And then we will be more uh, topical and less of the fun stuff. <laughs> or the distraction stuff that's, that's yeah yeah less of the jokes and uh the fun yeah. stuff and more of the serious business which is exactly that's fair and every time you swear i cut it out cleanly and nicely i i didn't know that you did that thank you i appreciate it i i, I will i will curse even more now <laughs> oh joking yeah just I make sure operation yeah we, we we can get declassified on YouTube for that, or it's yeah. it's not it's, it's not anymore. I believe uh, if if you don't swear in the first seven seconds or something, uh, you should be fine. So hacktivism, what is hacktivism? I think that most of uh, the people who are joining us and people who are watching us do do know the answer to that. But just to to be complete. Um, hacktivism is a digital form of of activism. So leveraging technology to advance the cause and bring out the message that the activists want to bring out. Uh, what kind of messages are we talking about? We're talking about different motivations, which can be patriotic hacktivism. So the pro-Russian activists that we see attacking Western countries whenever they say something political in support of Ukraine, or whenever there's sanctions against Russia, you might see those pro-Russian actors uh, come at it. Then you also have the Western world, so the patriotic Ukrainian actors who are attacking Russian targets. Uh, can be political, which can be inside the country, specific politics or specific reason uh, to go after politicians or to go after the police. What, what was it called again? Blue, uh, Daniel. Uh, you mean the 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 police operations with around yeah. Black Lives Matter and all that? Yes. Yeah. yeah exactly. That was 
Yeah, a lot of DDoSs there, a lot of defacements, a lot of data leaks over that. Those can be very triggering events. And then a very big one, it's uh, religion. Um, we, we saw a lot of activity from pro-Islamic and pro-Muslim activists. Who you know, are... that seems to be the constant in the hacktivist landscape, right? Like the patriotic yeah. and political things can kind of come and go, but it seems like there's always a constant of religious issues uh, yeah. to provide reactionary operations for these people. And then environment, which which is a kind of a low point for the moment, no? Um, it's been a while since I saw environment. Yeah, it's... It, there's a little too many things going on in the political stage right now. You know, they only have so many resources and can only focus on so many things at a time. But it it will definitely rear its head as we continue moving on in society. Yeah, it's certainly a, a big topic for for the I would say the physical activism or the non digital activism. Uh, just this week, we saw a German activist glue themselves to the roads where they had to come with a big hammer to, to break them out and, and transport them with a big stoner on, glued on their hand. So, uh, and throwing soup at the uh, artwork, that seems to be another constant in the uh, environment. But in the yeah, it's like the modern world area. defacement, right? You, yeah. you just take some soup, you throw it on some artwork, you say your cause. Yeah, that's... <laughs> IRL That's where defense. the tactics comes in. So you have the denial of service. It's like gluing yourself in the middle of the road. Then you have website defacement, like throwing soup into a picture. Uh, yep. Data breaches and data leaks. Um, media campaigns. So we have seen uh, similar tactics in, in physical or in real world activism. Uh, but the same comes back in digital activism. Now we will have several examples of this uh, throughout this, this presentation. So what does hacktivism look like in 2023 or better in the first first quarter as good as because what we've seen in 2023 was a big uptick in hacktivist activity. So 2022 was already a major increase compared to the previous years and that was mostly defined by the war in Ukraine. But while those volunteer cyber armies were creating new tools and at the same time they were what we call democratic democratizing the DDoS attacks. So, so they had tools, they improved existing tools, and they made them available to anyone that can use a computer. So now anyone who who can use a keyboard and a screen is able to launch DDoS attack because those tools are out there, they are up to date, they have new attack uh, vectors, they, they have been And there's a lot of guidance too. I mean, the and, IT army. Yeah, a lot of, of, of tutorials. Everybody, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah, Hack Your Mom did did a lot of tutorials on how to hack. Um, the IT Army of Ukraine website contains many tutorials on how to use Dead by a Thousand DDoS, MH DDoS, and in the by the end of 2022, they started automating their tools. So they started creating more of a volunteer botnet where they have the control of the command and control server, and then as an volunteer you download a bot you run it on your computer and they will stage the attack vectors in the command and control and that feed will come to your bot and your bot will start attacking and then we saw different kinds of uh, ranking lists where that that started with uh, no name no name 05716 started to create a ranking list of the top attackers and even providing financial incentive. Uh, first, if you were in the top 10, you got a certain incentive for the number one, two, and three, and then the rest was divided in the other seven. And then now, recently, No Name also moved into a new way of uh, financial incentive, which is paying out the people who are performing attacks in a ratio. So if the total number of attacks is 1,000 and you did 500 attacks of those 1,000, you would get like half of the total money for that day. And that's every day is a payout. And they're not using Bitcoin anymore. They're using Ton now for the payouts. So, but that same idea was also leveraged by the IT army. So now the IT army yeah. also have their automated bot and they also have their ranking list of the top ranked uh, attacker that's, that's in there. Which to um, me is very interesting because, you know, the IT army was leading the way for the first, let's just call it the first half, the first year of the war, uh, as far as innovation goes. But now you're starting to see that these Russian groups are taking and picking what worked for these yeah. groups and implementing them themselves, which is a very fascinating type of thing to see on the third landscape. Yeah, we will also see a big shift in, in by using our statistics um, because 
in 2022, it was mostly Killnet that made the headlines. So Killnet is very media, um, uh, how it's called, media wise, no media. Media savvy, yeah. Media savvy, exactly. That's the word that I'm searching for. Uh, so he, he did interviews with Russia Today. He did interviews with several journalists in the West. Uh, he made a lot of headlines. Also the DDoS attacks on airports in the US and Germany. So 2022 was defined in terms of Kilnet doing DDoS attacks. But this year, Kilnet is almost not doing any DDoS attacks. He, he has other activities now and trying to build a kind of Wagner cyber army. Yeah, I was gonna say, like last night, he uh, declared that he is now uh, no longer a hacktivist group; that it is now Wagner or Killnet PMC. Yeah, well, okay, the, pri <laughs> the private military cyber company, right? <laughs> PMCK. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, they're really trying to legitimize themselves here yeah. with uh, all these yeah. fancy little brandings and names. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we know they're still hacktivists. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we. I, I'm not so sure. He might be privatizing this under the name uh, Black Skills, and he might actually sell attacks for money instead of uh, because we have been seeing Kill Milk doing several attempts at at making money from 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 his different ventures. Like uh, you had yeah. the Infinity Forum, and then you had the the Underground, the Solaris Forum that he attacked for money. So first we thought it was to to create a budget and and to to have uh, to, to to have some something to invest in new attacks and new hacktivist attacks. Um, wait, I'm checking it that we have in the what's happening on, on YouTube. Making sure that that we are still live. Uh, uh -oh. YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. Says I'm sending enough. After 30 episodes, we have our first air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, can you check on, on internet? Everything yeah, yeah, is yeah. okay. Yeah, we're still live. I can see it. Yeah, strange. Okay. So maybe that that error was just a, a small glitch. Anyway, enough for the introduction. Uh let's dive in for the numbers. <laughs> so recent activity and I'm I'm going to put this on deck only so it's uh easier to view for the audience otherwise the slides will be a little small. The top claiming attack group. So so what what we did is tracking 80 different Telegram channels who are related to hacktivist accounts and also to DDoS uh, botnets and DDoS as a service groups. And we were tracking how many DDoS attacks they were claiming. And so across 80 channels in a period from 18 February until April 18th, we collected over 1,800 Claim DDoS attacks. Now, claim DDoS attacks means that there was a check host report where the actor is proving that there was an impact on the website they were attacking. Now, this check host report is only a snapshot, which means that it could very well be that the attack on that website only lasted for five minutes, just enough to create a permanent report link and then posting that link on their channel. On the other hand, we know that No Name is operating their DDoSia botnet. So when No Name is claiming a DDoS attack or a successful DDoS attack on a target, we also know that that target will typically have been targeted for at least 24 hours. Because No Name typically every morning they change the target lists in their botnet. So they will swap it out for new targets or they keep the targets. So we know that those attacks are much longer lasting. Uh, when we talk about Anonymous Sudan, Mysterious Team, Team Insane PK, they typically use other tools like cloud servers and proxies to hide the IPs from their cloud servers to perform their attacks. And while their attacks are very, fairly hef hefty, I would say, because we, we saw some attacks that, that were about 600 gigabit per second and higher from Anonymous Sudan. Uh, and also a lot of uh, application level attacks uh, that they, they performed. 
So so even though that they're fairly heavy, they might be not as long lasting as no name. No name typically has less impact in terms of bandwidth because no name is 100% going after the application level. So no name, we call them one of the more sophisticated uh, hacktivists uh, in terms of, of their DDoS attacks because they do recon. So before they go after a target, they will go on the website, they will look at the different pages of the website and they will try to find those pages that have most impact or that, that will create most impact. And what are those pages? That can be a search page. So that can be a get request for a certain search that will have the server in the back end go to the database, perform a search algorithm, then come back with the results. And so they what they will do is take that get request, encode it completely as an attack vector, and then randomize the search term. And then even randomize pagination to jump to page 10, to jump to page 1. They will also look after form posts so when your website has a form post that is public uh, then they, they they will post uh, information in that form and they will create a post form in such a way that they use the legitimate variable so they are not inventing random variables they're using legitimate variables and then they're using random content to put in those variables now they have different random variables that they're using their c2 feed that they send to the bot so the bot can choose out of different kinds of, of random variables for example if they need a phone number it will be 12 digits long it will be a random 12 digit number if you need an email address the, the first part of the email address will be six to 12 characters, uppercase, lowercase, and numbers that is randomized. If they need a text, a long text, they will randomize a whole text block. Um, so they have some very clever al algorithms with different random variables that can match the variables that are expected to be filled in from the web page, which makes it very hard to distinguish uh, legitimate from illegitimate web requests because that comes in as random data, but it's not like the, the request is invalid from a server perspective. From a server perspective, it's a completely valid request. So top claiming actor uh, for the first quarter uh, was no name 05716. Um, and yeah, must be clear, they, they are operating their Dossier botnet, so they are staging attack vectors every day since October, since, since we have seen them uh, actively running their, their Dossier project uh, October last year, every day they have been updating their attack vectors, uh, doing their recon, putting in uh, good web attack vectors, and then performing attacks for a duration of 24 hours. And then the day after, they change attack vectors again. Now, the number of volunteers has been up and down. Uh, but um, yeah, they, they have quite the following and they're, they're, they're increasing in influence. Um, not as high as Killnet yet, but um, compared to Killnet in terms of attacks, they're, they're much, much more present. And a second one who is uh, newer to the scene is Anonymous Sudan. So Anonymous Sudan, even though we started tracking him starting in January, uh, of this year after the attacks on Denmark and Sweden because that was like pretty much aligned with uh, pro-Russian attacks on Denmark and, or with the idea of Russian attacks on Denmark and Sweden because from a political or from a patriotic activism view, point of view Denmark and Sweden wanted to join NATO so that's the motivation to go after those two countries with attacks, and that's from a pro-Russian perspective. From an anonymous Sudan perspective, however, it was about religion, because there was a right, uh, right-wing person. It was a politician, I believe, that burned the Quran in front of the Turkish embassy in Sweden. Um, now that's religion because it's burning the Quran. However, <laughs> the reason why the guy burned the Quran in front of the Turkish embassy is because he didn't <laughs> agree with Sweden joining NATO, which is again in the Russian side of things. So whether anonymous Sudan at that point when attacking Sweden and Denmark was uh, either a political, political activist or a uh, religious activist was hard to say, but all the subsequent attacks or the attacks that Anonymous Sudan did after Denmark and Sweden 
really point into the direction of uh, being religious. Now, there are some rumors, and these come from Trusek, who is a company in Sweden. So, so yeah, there, there, there is some... They, they, they are a little bit biased because Sweden was the one that was joining NATO. Um, so they did a report saying that Anonymous Sudan is a false flag operation by the gov- Russian government instance, by the GRU, I believe. I don't know if they said as many words, but the press certainly did. Um, so that Anonymous Sudan would actually be a, a Russian uh, government actor. Uh, that is operating and trying to hide its attacks behind religious uh, motives and having it, a hard it, time I mean, yeah go ahead their, their their associations are very questionable one right we, we really don't know who they're associated with and it's i i guess it's kind of hard to believe that a group is coming out of sudan swinging so hard from a country that's been relatively quiet in the terms yeah. of the hacker landscape right it was uh, a surprise but, yeah yeah, need, needless to say, they're here and they're one of the hardest hitters out there. Uh, so, of course, everybody's going to be trying to figure out where they're from and who they're uh, uh, aligned with, which yeah. I think it's clear they're aligned with pro-Russian sentiment, but it also seems to be that they're also aligned with uh, religious activists as far as uh, anti-Muslim action. And, and with Sudan as well, because in, yeah. we will see in, in the attack charts that we made from, from anonymous Sudan's targeting that Ethiopia was uh, recently one of their targets and Ethiopia because they were fighting on a part of Sudan somewhere uh, there, there 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 was some some attack on the Sudanese part uh, or piece of of land um so so they attacked Egypt for that um, and also they, yeah, but- they they had some troubles when when there was this this military coup in uh, in in Sudan and the internet started having trouble and and power failures uh there, there were some some issues at that time as well yes one of my buddies was also pointing out that uh wagner pmc is also very heavily uh has a very heavy presence down there in north africa uh, among some of these rebel groups that are currently engaged in battle so uh yeah. seeing two uh, uh war landscapes kind of meshed together is a little yeah. nerve-wracking at this moment I well, think for to- a lot of people to, to, to add to the confusion, Kilmilk had the great idea of calling Anonymous Sudan an official member of Kilnet because of the attacks on Sweden and Denmark. So mm-hmm. that, that did make it easier. And Anonymous Sudan, of course, want to ride that wave and leverage that marketing opportunity and in his images puts Anonymous Sudan but Kilnet on top of it. So like being a member of, of a bigger activist organization. Although that I think that Anonymous Sudan is like is becoming more important especially in terms of DDoS attacks than Killnet itself so if I was anonymous Sudan I would drop the Killnet moniker another thing to note too is that the, the group right there user sec um, they, they are recently announced they didn't now announce but Killmilk announced that they are now officially part of the Killnet collective as well so uh, yeah. watching these social circles grow as the uh, uh, conflict progresses is uh, yeah, Kill, Killnet is, is 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 for sure one of the most influential, or not one of, is the most influential hacktivist group at this moment. Uh, they they are building the cluster, they are driving the community, they have most of the members. Uh, they are claiming a lot of attacks, even reclaiming attacks from No Name. And by the way, No Name is not associated with Killnet. Uh, they they made that clear. Uh, when a Russian Very clear. <laughs> wrote <laughs> wrote about no name being associated with Killnet, they 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 came back at the uh, at the hacker magazine Russia to say, hey, no, that's not true. We want to be independent <laughs> from Killnet. We have nothing to do with Killnet. So, no name is not a member of the Killnet cluster. It's they they are writing it out alone. Uh, the rest of the hacktivists in in Russia that perform DDoS attack pretty much all go back to Killnet. And to show the influence of Killnet, yeah, after Ratty was ratted out. <laughs> so Rat- Ratty was the administrator of uh, Anonymous Russia, who was in Belarus, and he was picked up by the authorities. Um, and Killnet... Uh, and- just, just a note, Anonymous Russia is Anonymous BY uh, in the chart above. They they, they, yeah. they go by a, a different Telegram channel, but that is anonymous Russia. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, anonymous. Just for our viewers, sorry. Yeah. sorry. 
Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I should have said that. Now there there is a new telegram because when when Ratty, so the admin of Anonymous Russia, as we knew it before two weeks ago, that Anonymous Russia was performing DDoS attacks, was part of the Killnet cluster, was very friendly with Killnet. A lot of uh, messages were forwarded between both of uh, the telegram channels. But then Ratty got arrested and Killmilk announced that uh, the existing channel for Anonymous Russia would be wiped. And it was. All the messages are gone. It's completely cleaned and created a new Anonymous Russia. And Killnet would also appoint a new um, a, a new head of Anonymous Russia. And he did appoint one. So it was actually, apparently, a According to Killmilk, it was Killmilk's doing of appointing somebody who would lead up Anonymous Russia going forward. So all the statistics that you see of Anonymous Russia in the presentation today, it's from the former Anonymous Russia, the Ratty version. The new version of Anonymous Russia is 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 gearing up to, to build a botnet and even to sell DDoS for hire services. So we might see some more attacks coming in the future. So something to keep in mind. There's there's a lot of politics going on inside of the political activists, uh, so to speak. They're not now, immune from it. No. Now something that stands out from this graph is that yeah, the number one is clearly pro-Russian. So it's uh, no name. Uh, it's pro-Russian activists doing attacks on the Western world or any, anybody who says something bad about Russia. Uh, the others, Anonymous Sudan and Mysterious Team, who are number two and three, uh, and then Team Insane PK, who's number four, are actually religious activists. So when we look in more detail at the different attacks, and let me take back this, so you can <laughs> see that out of the top five, three of them are religiously driven. Now you also see Passion Botnet, and Passion Botnet is also a special case. So Passion Botnet is Passion Group is a pro-Russian group, or at least they started out as a pro-Russian activist performing DDoS attacks. But then they moved into a commercial venture by creating a botnet, a DDoS for hire service. So now what they're doing, their attacks are sometimes a aligning with pro-Russian attacks, but the reason that they are aligning is that they want to do promotion. So Passion Botnet is providing a DDoS for hire service that can be sold and bought by pro-Russian activists. So and this was something that actually, I just started to cut in there, that, that was something that was really famous to see uh, back in the day with Lizard Squad, uh, when Lizard Squad would actually use their, their massive booter Sh Sharon, I think it was called Shinron, uh, Shinron, yeah. Uh, to launch attacks against major assets. They'd launch these huge attacks, the asset would go down, and they'd basically say, hey, look, what we attacked with our booter stressor, you can come buy it for $19 a month. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a pretty good way of going about it. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's something yeah, it's to see very, someone else do it. It's, it's, it's exactly the same story that happened to Passion and Passion Botnet. Um, and, and now you also see Passion Botnet attacking big cloud organizations. So you see attacks on Spotify, attacks on, on eBay, attacks on Twitter. So Passion is taking big cloud operation, big global cloud organization. And the reason they do it is to make promotion, to say, hey, we are able to take on the big ones. So, so Passion Botnet, not really counting as a pro-Russian activist at this moment, more as a commercial venture, uh, criminals that are out for uh, or driven by economics. So, and then after Passion Botnet, we have Anonymous and Cyber Army of Russia. Uh, Looking for Killnet, uh, this is the updated one. So Killnet, I see there, Killnet Reserves. Yeah, so what is this spot for Killnet? That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16th place. So Killnet ends in 16th place in terms of originally claimed activists, uh, or better DDoS attacks. I'm with, When I say originally claimed, I mean... Killnet claimed a lot more DDoS attacks than the 11 that I'm writing here in the last uh, two and a half months. However, most of the attacks that they claimed were actually copies from No Name, 
from the previous three days. So what they do is they take three days of activity by no name, they copy the check host links, and then they write their own post with all the check hosting and one long article. And I even have proof of that. So it's it's coming up. You will see the detail of that. It's kind it's kind of funny seeing anonymous Russia or not or not anonymous Russia Killnet uh, uh, pull some of the old school anonymous techniques. Yeah. You know, as far as repackaging data or, or or lying about outages, and you know here they are doing it. And, and yeah, as exactly. a result, they're not one of the they're not even the top ten. So it's a the sad yeah, so to see. So, so, so here you can see the stats of the reposting. You so you see uh, the light blue is repost, the dark blue is original posts. Um, Killnet is by no means the biggest reposter. Uh, biggest reposter is Team Insane PK and Mysterious Team, but those two are reposting each other's attacks all the time, and also the ones from Anonymous Sudan. Uh, yeah. But you see that the ratio between original claim to DDoS attacks and repost and DDoS attacks is, is fairly equal, or is even more attacks than reposts. However, when you look at Kilnat, they have like 11 attacks and they have more than 100, more than 110 reposts of attacks. So they, they have like mostly, they're doing reposts all day. Uh, same for, for actors like Ghost Palestine and Ganosek team, mostly reposting, yeah. no original attacks. Eagle Cyber too looks like yeah it's yeah. you know you you you, you, uh, you would think that, that over the years that they would learn not to uh, fake claims but you know, the well whole yeah idea of so tweet storms and all that other stuff to try and generate attention I get it but at some point it devalues your group like right now as we're looking at Killnet um, I wouldn't say it, Killnet especially devalued, Killnet but yeah yeah no go but your perspective changes you know yeah. But about Eagle Cyber, uh, Eagle Cyber is reposting from the other channels. It means that it's a repost of the original message mes posted by Mysterious Team. I count that as different than crafting your own message and copy pasting the links from the other teams and trying to claim them for yourself. And that's what Killnet's doing. What Eagle Cyber doing most of the time is just it's seeing messages from Mysterious Team and just reposting it on their channel, but attributing it to Mysterious Team. So it's uh, it's a little bit fair. So here's, for example, the one from Killnet. And here in Killnet, there's, there's no mention of, of no name here. Uh, and also that message was posted on April 16. So they are posting a whole lot of links on April 16. Make it look like they, they attacked those targets on April 16 and brought them down. However, when you go look into the report, some links are from April 13. So other links are from April 14. And when you look at the check host ID, because each report has a unique ID, all those reports were previously posted by no name. So those are original no name attacks that Killnet repackaged in their own message and summarized and put out there. Now, I can't say if they, they're doing it for malicious causes or they, they want to claim them as their attacks. It certainly feels like it. At the same time, it could also be that they just want to say, hey, the Russian pro-Russian community brought down all this host in the last three days. However, that's not clear from the topic that they're talking about. They're, they're just saying, hey, we're going after Hydro Quebec and we brought them down. Which is not true because Hydro Quebec was attacked three days ago, and it was No Name who claimed the attack. So yeah, it's uh, but we take that into account. We only count original claims, and we attribute them to the first actor who boasts about them, um, because that's typically the one who owns it. Now, in yeah. terms of countries, who was the most attacked during uh, the the little over two months and whenever you see updated that means that i took in the statistics from the last uh, nine days because the report the cutoff date for my data for the report that we published was uh, last not this monday but last monday so about nine days ago so this is updated with the latest information from today so that's whenever you see that batch updated you know that it's up to date with the information from april 27th and but the conclusions are the same and actually the rankings are pretty much the same there there's some small differences but uh it's it's basically almost the same trend that continues israel and india yeah they there used to be a bigger difference between israel and india israel was by far the top uh india 
called up because India is under constant attack by pro-Islamic uh, activists. But Israel has been hit hard and still is being hit hard even today as we speak. Anonymous Sudan is attacking Israel. Uh, and Anonymous Attack today claimed actually that the there was a, a electrical outage in Israel that caused a lot of uh, traffic jams and Anonymous Saddam claimed it. They claimed that uh, they did the attack. I don't know if it's done through DDoS attack or another intrusion. Um, that's also something that we need to take into account. We are only tracking DDoS attacks. So a lot of those <laughs> actors that you see on the list, they are also doing defacements. Uh, so Eagle Cyber is doing much more defacements than they're doing DDoS attacks. So it's not because we say that they only repost and almost do no original DDoS attacks. Eagle Cyber is not a hacktivist that typically does DDoS attacks. They are better in defacement, data leaks, uh, crafting, data leaks, and, uh, and, and information stealing. So that activity we are not tracking. We're only tracking the DDoS attacks at this point. So Israel, India, so two that were attacked out of religious motivations. Israel and up Israel, India, up India, uh, which is political, actually, uh, not religious. Well, yeah, no, it is it is religious uh, and political. Yeah, it's, it's political <laughs> statements that lead to, to religious <laughs> activists. Yeah, it, it, it was a politician who made a religious statement. Yeah, <laughs> it's <Yeah>. like that. <laughs> So, and then you have the first uh, in the pro-Russian attacks, which is Poland. Poland, which is a neighbor of Ukraine, who is a constant or almost constantly under attack by pro-Russian activists, especially no name. Then United States, also mostly in, under the pro-Russian pro flag. Uh, Australia, religious, for sure. And then Germany, uh, Ukraine, Sweden. Yeah, actually, Sweden, no, it's uh, religious. But Germany, Ukraine, pro-Russian, Italy, pro-Russian, then Denmark, it's again religious. Because those were attacks for anonymous Sudan, and he claimed those attacks were for burning the Quran, not because they were joining NATO. That was what Kilnad said. And then you have the others. So actually, most of the attacks are religiously driven and not political or patriotic activism. Looking at the number of attacks per country, and that's an updated slide because you see that Israel and India, it's a neck and neck race. Uh, well, yeah, race <laughs> for who is the most attacked. Uh, <laughs> India was below Israel uh, with a sign more significant amount, but uh, now it's catching up. So Israel and India by far the two most attacked countries, followed by Poland. I'd go so far to say that India uh, will overtake Israel in the next 30 days as as things taper off in Israel yeah. as we leave the confrontational month of April exactly uh, yeah. it, it, it will shift yeah that's that's something that should become clear <clears throat> once Daniel dives into up Israel and gives you the history of up Israel what typically happened in the last couple of years now we see an enormous activity on Israel but that's that should uh, start to drop off uh, in, in a couple of days I'm thinking two days if Exactly yeah, two days, know, the attacks will stop, right? <laughs> the 29th or something. This weekend, usually they taper off and they find a, a new shiny ball to go attack, which is clearly going to be India. Yeah, well, yeah, back back to business as usual, I would say, which is yeah. India. <laughs> <laughs> which we also can see clearly in the chart. So when we come back, so when, when we say back to business as usual, back to India, that's that's some conclusion that we saw from the chart. So it will come later in the deck and you will see it clearly that this is their business as usual for most of those uh, activists. Um, let me get back to the deck. Yeah, so you can see it more clear. So here you have a heat map of country versus actors. So, so that way we can see who is attacking which countries. And one that stands out when you go to the right side of the presentation, and yeah, you cannot see my mouse, but uh, no name 05716 is there. And you can see that they have a lot of different countries that they attacked. The most attacked countries with 114, the dark blue one is Poland, so no name performs most attacks against Poland, followed by Italy, followed by Germany. Now, if you look at those countries, those are all countries who made political statement against Russia. 
So you have Canada there, recently it was attacked, Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, France, Germany. Yeah, Germany. I was going to say, Germany got the evil side of the uh, sticker yeah. from uh, St. PK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Ger Germany. Well, yeah, Ger Germany was uh, Rhine. Uh, well, how it's called? Rheindahl? No, not Rhine. <laughs> Rheindahl. Rheindahl is the encryption. Um, the, the, the weapons manufacturer who's making tanks. Um, yeah. yeah pretty much with the Rhine. story of yeah. Germany, right? Yeah. Now, when, when you look at other big hitters like Team Insane PK on India, 109 attacks. Also on India, 85 attacks, Mysterious Team, 19 attacks, Anonymous Sudan. If you look at Anonymous Sudan, most attacks and the countries, Israel, Denmark, Australia, Ethiopia, France, a couple on Germany. And actually, when you go in the messages and you look at the ones that were attacking Germany, they were saying to support our Russian friends. So that one was actually aligned with pro-Russian hacktivists. But all the others, attacks on India, on Israel, the attacks in Denmark were because of burning the Quran. In Australia, it was because of no man, not a man's dream that had a model featuring <laughs> Allah walks with me in a transparent dress uh, and walking on the catwalk like this so so and that shocked the muslim community and that's where the pro-islamic uh activists shocked came more than just them. the muslim community it was a very yeah. bold statement there to yeah. do. <laughs> so so you you can see from australia so the top line so 85 attacks were from mysterious team 41 anonymous sudan and then 10 attacks were claimed by team in saint pk um pakistan so that aligns with religion um also the attacks on sweden the attacks in india those all align so anonymous sudan for me is still mostly a religious activist and less of a Iranian. no name is clearly the the countries that you see there listed are clearly in everything that's a pro-russian tax yeah and passion botnet the number one targeting us but the reason we already said it's commercial they go after the big cloud uh the global cloud organizations to try to promote their botnet now as we have all the websites that are attacked we also looked at the website categories um, important to note that these are not verticals these are website categories so when we say business and economy that's a business website like uh what could be a business website uh any website like uh, yeah <laughs> difficult to find one now but like, right like right that's called business yeah interior design architecture you know home flipping all that kind of stuff yeah so 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 anything that's related or put out there from a business is typically categorized as business um government that's a government website travel travel can be um uh, railway uh airplanes so so um uh, airports Buses, all that kind of yeah yeah uh shipyards um ports, taxi services ports taxi services but also generic travel websites where you can find information about traveling not governmental traveling advice that comes in government and then financial services are pure the ones that's uh the ones who provide financial services like paypal and visa and and banks, of course, they all come under financial services. And education is everything with education. The monopoly, man. <laughs> yeah. Hel health and medicine is healthcare. And then, of course, military is the military websites. So you can see top category, business and economy, followed by government, travel, financial services, education, health and medicine and military. So those are like the top categories that you will see attacked um, with government by far the number one most specific website that is targeted by hacktivists. I, don't know, I was going to say that's like a direct message type of category, right? Like when you see yeah, hacktivists exactly. targeting government organizations, it's because they want to send a message. When you see them attacking like business, economy, travel, uh, that that's the kind of thread uh, discourse. That's for uh, getting chaos, you know getting atten attention. Yeah, that's for the media yeah. to pick up and to, as you say, for causing chaos. Now, government that's that's directly uh, directly on on the alarm bell. Yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> that's, that's direct yeah. to the face punch there. <laughs> 
business is taking a half pitch. <laughs> yeah. It becomes a little bit more detailed and, and interesting when you look at the different actors and what categories they go after when you look at no name, uh, government, uh, yeah, business and economy. That's like a catch all version. So there's lots of websites in there. But then the prime categories like government is, is for sure one of the, the, the most targeted and travel. We saw a lot of attacks on airports. Uh, as well. I, mean, I, I look at this chart and I just sit there and look at anonymous Sudan's targeting, like targeting educational vertical and targeting yeah. health and medical vertical. Yeah. Like, they, they, they're really going for high impact here. Yeah, well, they, they also announced it. Uh, I remember like in, in Denmark, they said, now we're going to go after the hospitals and now we're going to go after government. And they did the same in uh, France. They said, ah, oh, we're going to go after the universities tomorrow. And the day after, we're going to go after government. And the day after, we're going to go after healthcare. So Anonymous Sudan is very categorized. And airports is also a very famous one. And that's what you see in travel. Yeah. So so this 98 uh, for Anonymous Sudan in travel, those will be mostly airports and and also um, shipping ports, uh, where there's ships, uh, it's another port. I was going to say, I think yesterday, Anonymous Sudan also took out uh, some European traffic Isra port. Site. Yeah, Isra yeah. port was one of the attacks yesterday uh, that I saw. So now, interesting part is uh, diving down into the analysis per group. So looking at no name first, um, so also updated slide. So no name, business as usual is Poland. So clearly you can see there's like Poland is almost coming back every day in their attack vectors. There is a, a slight concentration in the last week uh, where they had did more attacks on Poland than usual. Uh, the other ones that you see with the circles, uh, Canada, so going alphabetically, Canada, that was because uh, Prime Minister Trudeau announced support for Ukraine. Germany, Rheindal, uh, again, uh, the company. Italy is also political support for um, Ukraine and United Kingdom, same thing, a statement uh, and providing support for Ukraine. So you can see clearly where those epicenters are, where you had prolonged campaigns where no name was attacking specific countries. <clears throat> On the Ukraine side, yeah, you have some, some points, but it's not like Ukraine is that much attacked. And that's, that's fairly typical for the hacktivists. So most of the hacktivists are attacking Western countries, but they stay out of Ukraine. And one of the potential reasons for that is that they don't want to interfere with ongoing activities of the government. Imagine right. that government actors are doing activities there and then no name comes in and just jumps all over the place and destroys the whole campaign that 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 russia had planned uh that would accidentally ddos uh, well. russian honeypot yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah stuff <laughs> stuff stuff like that or outs it and or brings attention to a certain target that uh, the russian military was going after and didn't want to be revealed um things like that so typically you will see them less in in, in ukraine with the exception of the cyber army of russia these these are mostly uh, after ukraine Looking at Anonymous Sudan, and here you can clearly see uh, a distinguished pattern with all the operations. So Anonymous Sudan came first out. Uh, we heard first about them when they were attacking Denmark and Sweden. So you see Sweden and Denmark as the first uh, circles uh, when you go from left to right. So through the different dates. Um, but then after they went to France and then from France, they stopped their campaign in France and then they went to help their friends, uh, Mysterious Team and Insane PK, Team Insane PK and up Australia. So they started targeting Australia and after that they joined their friends, well, friends, their co-hacktivists, uh, how do I call them, in up Israel and attacking Israel, but then you had that uh, the whole problem with uh, Sudan, where the war now starts inside Sudan, um, and also attacks by Egypt and, and claims by, by Egypt and Ethiopian media uh, that were apparently providing false information or bad information about Sudan. So there's a hiccup there uh, on Ethiopia and Egypt as well. So you can clearly see where the where the epicenters are of their attacks. Mysterious team, if you look at the pro-Islamic activist Mysterious team, who was 
joining his brothers in arms in Australia and then also in Op Israel still going on up today. But as you can see, India is their business as usual. It's it's what they do typically and then they shift to somewhere else perform a tax and you can even see that you have india tax here there's a hole in, in australia so then they do australia and then they come back to india and then they go back to australia so it's like perfect alignment uh of their attacks and, and who they focusing but on it also share. shows you like how how limited their resources are i don't mean to say that they're limited resources yeah. but it just shows that how they only can use certain assets for certain operations at certain yeah. times which is uh very insightful they're not everywhere all the time exactly so and the the same pretty much the same pattern if you compare mysterious team and team insane pk the pattern is, is is fairly similar yeah so they have the business as usual which is india went to australia and then up israel also to come in and go after them so that was uh some of the most prominent actors uh going now to the country so at the country level we should also see who is attacking who and, and in how many attacks per day so when we look at australia of course we had a well-defined up australia we started uh, pretty much here, so in March, so after so the week after the Melbourne Fashion Festival, that's when the whole hell broke loose. Uh, starting with Mysterious Team and Team in Saint Piquet, and then joined by Anonymous Sudan. Um, now the color of the attacks is not the same on each slide. I have to say that uh, because you can see the grading here, dark. Brown means more than 50 attacks in a single day by Mysterious Team. So 50 different websites claimed by Mysterious Team in one day. That's a lot. If you look at those slides here, here the scale is 16. So, so you see that the scale is a little bit different in some cases. So do not always think that light red means that it's not a lot of attacks. No, it is still a lot of attacks. You can also see that the groups that were targeting Australia were... Um, Anon Cyber, so Anonymous Vietnam, Anonymous Sudan, Mysterious Team, Eagle Cyber, and Team in Saint PK. We also have Passion Botnet, but as I said, that's for a different reason. So then, in the same country, also in Australia, so the top claiming actors, so you can see by far it was Mysterious Team and, and Anonymous Sudan, with most of the activity. So Mysterious Team, almost 60% of the activity in Australia. And the most attacked websites were travel, business, education, health, and then government. Poland, also a very pronounced and specific uh, picture. You see Anonymous Russia, Anonbuy. So Anonymous Russia there uh, in February doing a lot of attacks on Poland, but who is the constant or the business as usual? That's no name 05716. So they are constantly staging attack vectors against Poland and attacking Poland. They're definitely one of the most persistent threat groups out there, that's for sure. Well, yeah, they have their botnet, so they stage a vector every day and they're attacking 24-7. Um, the others are not attacking 24-7. The others are really like going to their console, starting an attack, and putting in a target, starting the attack. Um, while No Name is just feeding in target lists, and then it's all the bots from the volunteers that start doing the attacks. So it's a different kind of approach, and it clearly pays off for, well, pays off for, for No Name, uh, in terms of uh, the activity that we see. So No Name and Anonymous Russia, top claiming actors, uh, and you can see they are mostly pro-Russian. Anonymous Sudan has, has done a couple of attacks in support of their Russian friends, but uh, it's mostly all pro-Russian activists. There is no pro-Islamic activists here, like uh, Team Insane PK or Mysterious Team, who is attacking Poland. And here, right. Poland... And their absence can definitely show you the motive behind the attack is yeah, more exactly. war-based. So, and also Anonymous Sudan, who's prominent in all the other religious attack campaigns, only 2% here. So it shows that he was knighted a member of the Kilna cluster, and he wants to respect 
this nomination, I guess. So he sometimes joins them in a couple of attacks, but it's not his primary objective. The primary objective clearly lies with the other activists like Team in Saint Piquet and Mysterious Team. Whenever they attack, you also see Anonymous Sudan and a good amount of attacks joining in. In terms of uh, top attack web categories in Poland, the government stands out uh, a lot. So it's uh, mostly government who gets attacked. Financial services travel um, is the other two that are important ones for, for Poland. Looking at Ukraine, and the reason we take Ukraine here is not because there are big attacks going on, it's just like it's interesting to see how much of the activists are actually going to the country that they are fighting with. Because I'd actually say that the absence, right? It's almost like yeah. to see the absence from the charges. Well, yeah, it's 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 ten. So so you have like ten, maximum ten attacks claimed in a single day. So it's 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 all fairly. It's like one two uh, attacks, and mostly cyber army of Russia. Those are the ones that are mostly doing a couple of attacks in. Ukraine, but all the others, there's almost no presence, no name from time to time goes to a certain target in Ukraine. But if you compare it to Poland, the activity that they do in Poland, you see the no name activity here in Poland, that's almost constant and that's continuously in darker red color, so well above the six to eight attacks. While here, no name typically stays like three to four attacks and then in one exceptional day they had like 10 followed by nine attacks so so much less targeting of ukraine and much more targeting of western countries outside of ukraine by pro-russian activists <clears throat> looking at india so there you can see team in saint pk mysterious team so, so team in saint pk especially uh, in terms of continuity of the activity, mysterious team in terms of uh, having the most attacks, more than 30 attacks claimed on April 24th or April 25th, something like that. Um, the others that you see, Anonymous Sudan, there we have for a couple of days, but not that much. Um, member 177, um, NCF, which is, how? Uh, what was it again? Nigeria. A Nigerian Nigerian cyber force cyber force exactly that's the one I was looking for um, so you see it's a different kind of actors that are targeting India well except for the team in Saint PK and mysterious team in anonymous Sudan so but all religious while the others the pro-Russian are not targeting India so in terms of most attacks team in Saint PK mysterious team anonymous Sudan non Vietnam and Eagle Cyber. And then in terms of top targeted web categories, and here's an interesting one, financial services and government, more than 50% of the attacks. So pretty much targeting government, but also financial services they like to... Uh, but as I say, in the previous alerts that we put out about India, uh, most of the reaction, reactionary ops are based off of government. There's political yeah. statements that come from government officials. So that's pretty much par for the course, in my opinion. Yeah. And then before we jump into Op Israel, it's a good segue here. <laughs> what happened in the country of Israel in the last uh, couple of months? And, and we see Op Israel very clearly defined. Um, and the it's just, a bunch of, just a bunch of crap, Pascal. No one cares about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Zooming oh, into man. the deck, uh, you can see the the actors behind the attacks. There's no pro-Russian actors mentioned here, yeah, except for Passion Botnet, Passion who comes back everywhere, but that was actually outside of Op Israel, so it doesn't count. I'm sorry, Passion, your right. attack was disqualified. It was a little count. too early. It was yeah. a, little, a little too early there. <laughs> so, but uh, everything that's inside Op Israel uh, and on Cyber Vietnam, uh, and on Ghosts, Anonymous Sudan, Mysterious Team, Eagle Cyber, Ganosec, Team in Saint PK, Turk Hack Team, User, oh, user Sec is, is pro Russian. Uh, 
So they they mingled in a couple of attacks there. So well, I wouldn't say they, they they weren't quite announced as part of Killnet during this segment. They were just recently brought into Killnet. So uh, okay. they're, they're on they're on the fence, right? <laughs> yeah, they are, they're suffering from an identity crisis for the moment. Okay, they're trying it to happens. find themselves. Yeah, they want they want to be with the cool kids. So well, that so is the perfect segue to understand what happened in Israel. So why were all the attacks there? Why this big cluster of attacks? And, and where does it come from? And what is the history behind it? Because we could all say exactly what was going to happen even before it started happening. Because it happens yeah. every year. Although it cooled very... down quite a bit. But uh, this year, it's back in full force. It's a, it's a very uh, predictable operation for the last 10 years. Now, it's a, some people have called it a fail off in recent years because they have uh, fallen off and they haven't done so well. But in general, uh, April is a very heated month for the country of Israel from both the physical and the cyber uh, perspective. So just generally... Uh, we're going to start covering, there we go, I got control now, <laughs> uh, what is Op Israel? Uh, so basically Op Israel is an anonymous operation. Uh, this operation was launched in November 2012 in response to a military operation. So originally it wasn't a yearly campaign. This was just a one-off campaign or one-off uh, attack, uh, basically in response to what Israel called the pillar of defense. And this is very typical. Uh, for Israel, if you follow like a lot of their geopolitical issues, um, basically a bunch of uh, terrorists outside of Israel launched rockets. It was 100 rockets that were fired at Israel within 24 hours uh, from the Hamas-governed strip of Gaza. Uh, and in return, uh, Israel had to respond and defend themselves. And because they respond and defend themselves, a bunch of hacktivists decide that they're going to go out there and they're going to use this as an opportunity uh, to speak for the Palestinian people. Uh, they felt like the Palestinian people are voiceless and the way that they could bring attention to uh, their cause in November of 2012 was, was by launching DDoS attacks. And those DDoS attacks had um, somewhat of a success, right? It wasn't a major success, but it was enough to kind of generate attention. And this was because they launched successful DDoS attacks, defacement attacks, and data leaks. Uh, and, and specifically around these operations, uh, uh, like Op Israel, where you have a lot of attention and a lot of different groups being involved, uh, you see creations of specific tools for these operations. Uh, so back in the day, I think this guy's name was Hackstroke. Uh, he created this tool uh, specifically for uh, uh, the operation. This is also something that we saw this year uh, as well with tools being created for the operation. Um, there's also defacement attacks that happen, right? So as I say many times before, this is like digital graffiti, uh, where in the tent sense that a threat actor is going to just deface a website, uh, spread a message, a, a political message or a religious message in this sense. Uh, and then there's also data leaks, right? So where you have multiple threat actors that are going out there, compromising websites and leaking data. Now, uh, a lot of times this data isn't really that important. It might just be a list of uh, Facebook pages or cell phone numbers, uh, but they leverage this very well in the operations. They, they will actually send text messages to people with very horrifying images and anti-Semitic messages, which is very impactful. And while a lot of people won't want to say this is a highly technical operation, uh, it is impactful, right? So there are people out there that do not know basic security and not know how to update their passwords on their routers or the IP addresses or their basic servers or CMSs and whatnot. Uh, and because of that, they post videos of live streams from people's houses, they post their data, they post their phone numbers, they post all kinds of things. And uh, it, it has a high impact, even though it's not a very technical side of hacking, right? Uh, a lot of people like to kind of put down denial of service as something that's not important, and it's not important to them, but it's important to other people that aren't protected. Uh, looking forward, I think I lost control again. Yeah, sorry. It's all good. Uh, in, in the beginning, after the inaugural operation in November 2012, Anonymous thought it would be a great idea to start a yearly campaign. And so in 2013, specifically April 7, 2013, Anonymous launched Op Israel, the official yearly operation. And the goal was basically to erase Israel from the Internet, which is a very, very bold objective. Uh, but this also ran parallel to the Holocaust Remembrance Day and all kinds of other holidays that were going on inside of Israel, both on the Muslim and the Jewish side of things. Uh, so it's a very tense time inside the country. Uh, like I said before, Anonymous was basically using this operation uh, uh, to, to 
speak about human rights violations that they perceive that were happening to the Palestinian people. Uh, and they hope that this was going to bring uh, attention to this really Palestinian conflict. Now, the one thing I want to kind of talk about in 2013 is how it immediately became a fail op, right? So this is a word that's used inside of anonymous to describe an operation that is a failure. Uh, so in the first year, there is a response to anonymous's op Israel uh, from 2012 called the Israeli Elite Force. And this was a group of pro-Israeli hacktivists uh, that decided to go out there uh, and be proactive as far as trying to hack the hackers that are hacking them. And they were very successful about feeding the internet with tools that were backdoored. Uh, and these criminals downloaded these tools to attack Israel and they got nice little pictures of all these hackers. You can go up and look at online uh, Israeli elite force. And this is just one of many screenshots they got of these kids that were launching DDoS attacks at the time against Israel. And the reason why I want to bring this up is because these are kids, predominantly teenagers from Southeast Asia. Uh, th this is the primary uh, attacker here that we see in Op Israel. We really don't see anything from uh, a state-sponsored or state-aligned perspective, right? So then uh, as operation continued into 2014, 2016, uh, there was a serious emphasis on trying to push the narrative of a pro-Palestinian perspective. Uh, and, and this was a lot, it gained a lot of attention from the hacktivists inside of Anonymous, right? There, there was a cause, there was a reason, uh, there was a lot of emotion behind it, so people started gathering in. Uh, and they're basically using these people, what we kind of see today as a crowdsourced botnet, right? But there wasn't instruction and control like we see, it was more or less what they called use new blood packages. Uh, these new blood packages would basically say, download this tool, this tool, this tool. And then through tweet storms online, they would say, hey, use this tool at this time to attack this target. And there was great success to that back then, but it kind of started tapering off after 2016 uh, because they start losing attention. So one thing I want to specifically say about Op Israel and any general anonymous operation uh, is they like to manipulate facts. So in the beginning, in 2013, the first year of the operation, the main Twitter account for Op Israel claimed that they caused over $3 billion in damage to the country of Israel, which is clearly not the case. Uh, but the problem is that this kind of information actually creates a lot of attention for these groups. It bolsters their reputation and it creates an atmosphere of uncertainty around the group's capability. So the reason why I want to bring this up is coming out of 2014, 2016, people had this idea that Anonymous was this huge threat and this huge operation called Off to Israel was going to have massive impacts for you to come. Uh, and that was because a lot of people were looking at this. They were looking at repackaged data leaks. They were looking at false claims of outages. They were looking at all these things saying, hey, this is actually impactful. But in reality, these weren't the case. Uh, and that helped build Anonymous's reputation. But unfortunately, in 2016, we had the US presidential election. And Anonymous learned very quickly that a group that didn't support political uh, 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 parties ended up supporting political parties. And by that, what I mean is basically half of Anonymous support Hillary Clinton, half Anonymous support Donald Trump. And there was so much infighting that Anonymous ended up losing resource and support. Uh, because of that, Anonymous is off Israel completely fell apart going into 2017. There's really no resources. No one really kind of left to carry the, 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 the lightning rod, as I like to call it. Uh, even though that there's a lot of political tension in the area, we saw a couple different groups rise up, specifically in this example, uh, Hackers of Savior, uh, which was a group, as they claim, was it uh, Iranian hackers in Iraq or something like that? It was It was a very confusing attribution statement when I read it. Uh, but anyways, they stepped up to do a couple defacement campaigns, a couple DDoS attacks during the month of April, just to kind of remind uh, 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 Israel that the, the threat hadn't disappeared. Uh, but it was, right? And, and it was kind of interesting at this time because a lot of people would go out there and say, Op Israel's coming, there's going to be massive impact, uh, this is going to be a bad thing for everybody, and then nothing would happen, right? And so people started losing confidence and faith in reporting on Op Israel. A lot of people didn't want to go out there and talk about it because they knew it was going to be a fell off. And then you'd have these lone wolves like Hacker of Savior that would show up and actually have some kind of impact that would remind people like, hey, the operation hasn't completely disappeared. Um, then going out of 2020 into 2021, 2022. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Let me, let me go back to this. I forgot I put this slide in here. Uh, one of the 
greater reasons why Anonymous was leaving these operations in 2019 uh, was because of the escalation of the threat landscape. So in 2019, the Israeli Defense Force IDF launched an airstrike against this building in Gaza. Uh, why? Because this building in Gaza housed multiple uh, cyber operators for Hamas. Uh, they were launching cyber attacks at the time against Israel in the month of April. And because they were engaged in such attacks against Israel, uh, Israel decided to drop a bomb on the location and to cease the threat, which was the second time in history that a government agency had dropped a bomb on a hacker. The first one being the United States in 2015. Uh, the hacker's name was Jadane Hussein, aka Trick, who decided to go down to, I think it was Syria at the time, to join ISIS, and he became like the number one threat in the cyber caliphate, which was extreme. But anyways, to get back to the point is that there, there start to be these examples to hackers and hacktivists, threat actors, uh, that it wasn't just, hey, someone's gonna kick down your door and put you in handcuffs. If you were an actual enemy combatant in a threat landscape, you could be attacked. And this is some of the issues that are kind of coming up right now with the IT army as far as, should they legalize them? Should they not legalize them? Because if they legalize them, they become active enemy combatants and Russia could technically bomb them. If you don't legalize them, then they can be arrested for launching DDoS attacks. So it's a little bit of a situation. Uh, this is why I always advise people when you're getting involved in cyber war or any kind of cyber conflict, consider uh, the crime and the time that you might be facing for doing it. Uh, okay, so going back to going into 2021 and 2022 uh, with Anonymous completely missing uh, and not wanting to engage with Israel or even risk being bombed, uh, a group of uh, Southeast Asian teenagers once again joined in and decided to carry the torch for Op Israel. And they did it underneath an op called Op Badil. I hope I pronounced that right. And so it was basically launched to fill the void uh, uh, that Anonymous had left for Israel. Uh, this campaign was nowhere close to notorious as Op Israel, but it did renew the risk for the region. These groups were creating tools. They had a very, very active forum that's still active to this day with over 10,000 members. Uh, they're, they're very good at graphic design and organization. Their tools are not so great, uh, but they do have impact. And, and that's something to note that they, they were able to uh, carry the gap for those two years. Now, going into 2023 this year, we saw the return of Op Israel. And this was mainly attributed because the uh, escalation of war in Russia and Ukraine, right? So the geopolitical tensions in Israel also didn't really help the situation, but it helped set the stage for the return of mainstream hacktivism into the region, and it did return. Uh, we issued several alerts before Op Israel had actually begun, listing out all the names of the groups that were going to be involved uh, and some of the attack tools they planned on using, uh, and, and they sure enough delivered. And one of the interesting things about this is that Dragon Force Malaysia also joined Op Israel, uh, Anonymous is Op. So this is something that was interesting that, you know, coming out of 2019 with Anonymous completely disappearing and Dragon Force Malaysia carrying the torch. In 2023, we saw them actually kind of combine and start launching attacks together and use the same battle attack, Op Israel, uh, which, which results in a lot of impacts. I think a lot of people have seen the news that Israel suffered very seriously from some of these script kitties and these uh, half cocked tools, but when they're done in a large group or, or an organized group, it can be very, very devastating. Uh, so examples of some of the threat groups that were involved. I mean, we had dozens of threat groups involved this year. Normally, there's only just a few, a handful, uh, uh, but we had dozens. I mean, dozens and dozens of threat groups. I'm not going to sit here and read through them all, but these were some of the threat groups that uh, Pascal just recently covered in some active threat groups, and we've seen some of the operations as far as off Israel goes. Um, I lost control there when we changed. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. I made it bigger. No, no, you're all good. Can see. Um, as I mentioned, every year, normally, uh, and successful years in Alpha Israel, you'll see threat groups release tools. Uh, so Cyber Eagle over on the right released their ECC DOS tool, uh, which is basically a lever, layer 7 HTTP attack tool. And then also Dragon Force Malaysia uh, released their own attack tool, uh, uh, what was it called? Cyber Troopers. And basically this was an HTTP, HTTP UDP, and TCP attack tool. Uh, the tool did have a well, few issues here and there. Yeah, te te technically not UDP because they were sending UDP packets encapsulated in TCP because the author doesn't know the difference between creating a TCP socket and a UDP socket in Python. 
Hey, and to be fair, some security experts do even look at the tool and start trashing on it without even knowing about it, right? But yeah. two out of three <laughs> attack vectors worked, and, and the threat group seemed to have a very good success in taking down targets in Israel. Um, one thing I want to mention about the Dragon Force IO tool is inside the screenshot that's not seen here uh, that was shared by the threat actor, this tool was underneath a, a folder. Uh, which ChatGPT also had a folder. So you had the Cyber Trooper folder and you had a ChatGPT folder underneath the same project folder of the threat actor. Now, we're not saying that the threat actor used ChatGPT to create his tool. Uh, but Maybe he should have. Maybe it would have been better. <laughs> right. But after conversations, I, I, I held an impromptu Ask Me Anything with uh, Dragon Force Malaysia, their Discord channel, mm -hmm. uh, basically to figure out what this meant. And, and they said, no, they didn't use the... ChatGPT for this tool specifically, but the threat group is using ChatGPT to assist them. Uh, now, now they're basically using it for Q&A, but this is something just to kind of note that threat actors are starting to use available AI tools that just recently come out to help them. And this could become a threat in the future. I'm not saying yeah, it's a threat one, now, but it... One thing that I think that they used it is the letter. Remember that letter that they wrote that sounded like a government or presidential issued yes. note? Uh... Which, which could have been done by ChatGPT. So what Pascal's re referencing is the public PR memo. Uh, as, as I mentioned, Dragon Force Malaysia is really good at graphic design and they built a two page memo, a full PR report and published it on the internet, uh, calling on journalists and everybody else to enjoy their, uh, their attack against Palestine. Uh, but the, the, the PR letter itself was written as if it came from a professional PR agency. It was, it was, uh, very interesting the way it was laid out. And of course, there's little issues here and there with all AI uh, generated content. But, uh, it, you know, it just shows how threat groups could be using these tools in the future to benefit their campaigns. Uh, and so moving on here. Uh, Third time's a charm. Unexpected guests of Israel. So we had one major unexpected guest. Now, when we wrote our original threat alert before the campaign launched, none of us had any clue that Anonymous Sudan was going to throw their weight uh, into Op Israel. Now, Anonymous Sudan, as, as Pascal had shown in the previous slides, uh, is a very serious threat group that is launching large attacks, and they uh, definitely have the resources to continue day after day in different regions and, and, and launch serious campaigns. Anyways, they decided to actually join Op Israel, which was very, very strange. And many groups began using uh, their name and their defacements as a way to kind of build up their reputation and leverage for the campaign. Uh, and it became very notable as Anonymous Sudan chose a specific vertical every day uh, to target and, and they're very methodical as far as targeting one vertical every day and moving to another one uh, and, and with high impact and they also are very media savvy uh, to the point that they were able to not only get media attention but they were able to create media attention uh, by some of the things that they were saying about the media and their own telegram channel so uh, oh yeah yeah, definitely... yeah yesterday they were announcing that they were attacking the Mossad so if you want attention <laughs> those are the ones you need to attack <laughs> <laughs> I, I always remember the back in the old day it was that uh, the, the hacker jester would redirect the DDoS attacks to Mossad. So if you ever attacked him, you're attacking Mossad, which uh, I think both oh, of us can attest. You yeah. should never do that. <laughs> now, an, uh, a, another kind of funny one, well, f funny, not funny, from Anonymous Sudan is that at some point, so when Sudan was under attack and the internet was down, he wanted to have Elon Musk's Starlink network in Sudan. So he wanted the <laughs> yes. attention. He wanted the attention of Elon Musk. So, what is the activist way of getting attention? It's doing a DDoS attack. So he didn't find anything better to do than DDoS Twitter asking for attention from Elon Musk to have <laughs> Starlink come to Sudan. So it just. Yeah, just saying. <laughs> I, I just, you know, punching the person that you're asking a request for is probably not the best move, but, yeah, but it sure yeah. did create a lot of attention, right? And that's why I say that media is savvy as far as, uh, uh, you know, that what what a bold move. Let me attack Elon Musk while asking him for free services. You know, that's yeah. that's almost a move that Elon Musk himself would do too. So like, you have to applaud it in a way, saying like, you know, the bold life that we live. <laughs> Uh, but yes, Anonymous Sudan was a, a major threat, and as Pascal also mentioned, uh, they are currently still attacking Israel uh, because comments that Israel has made re regarding Sudan. 
Um, generally, Op Israel ends uh, this weekend. Uh, so it ends during Al Qaeda's uh, day, which is the celebration of Jerusalem Day, I think, and for the Iranian Iraqis. Um, after that, usually the operations taper out. So generally, you have Op Israel at the beginning of April, and you have Op Jerusalem at the end. Op Jerusalem is pretty much faded out over the years and doesn't really exist. Uh, but what you'll have is you'll have tag on operations. So you'll have uh, anonymous Sudan attacking Israel on Monday, basically, and still saying it's Op Israel. Now, is it really Op Israel? No, they're just using the battle tag because we're outside the actual days of Op Israel. Uh, but expect anonymous Sudan to stick around in the region as other pro-Muslim activists start looking at India. So getting into this little fancy graph as well, <laughs> uh, if you want to look at the uh, top claiming attackers uh, that were targeting Israel over the last few months, uh, clearly a mysterious team uh, has been one of the top ranking attackers across multiple categories. And of course, a top ranking attacker in Israel. Anonymous Sudan, Anonymous Sudan is really no surprise here in the same team and the same team PK uh, is also there. I think more of the interesting thing is looking over at the web categories. I used to call those verticals, but now we have to call it web categories uh, that, that were targeted. Yeah, in, in those, those are not verticals because I, I got them from, from tools that are categorizing websites. So I did not use business information tool to find what kind of business that the company that runs the website is in. It's actually what is the websites category so when you go surf and you want to to block your kid from going to porn sites or other kind of uh, uh, business uh, or, or monetizing sites or social media you can do url blocking in your firewall it's actually those categories that i use because it was the most yeah. obvious to categories web websites i think it's a fair way of doing it but if you look over at the top web categories targeted during op israel uh, you, you can kind of see what we were talking about as far as message versus like taking someone hostage versus punching the government in the face because the top attacking verticals are going to be business travel education that's because they're trying to harass israelis the whole entire purpose behind op israel is to harass the local citizens and to remind them about what the palestinian people are trying to say uh, attacking the government really doesn't solve anything because the government's not going to do anything uh, so they mainly focus on small, medium-sized businesses and also citizens of Israel as a form of harassment to spread the message and propaganda. So with that, looking forward to the threat landscape of the future uh, and the new face of hacktivism, basically. The threat landscape uh, of the future. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's constantly evolving, right? And we kind of laugh at like what it used to be 10 years ago and what it is today. And I think some people have a hard time getting over that DDoS was still here, but I don't think it's going anywhere. It's going to be a main and prevalent attack vector for every geopolitical conflict going yeah, forward. Ha hacktivist and activism will not go anywhere. Sorry to say. Right, that. exactly. And, and that's what we're, we're seeing here from this presentation is that we're seeing renewed operations worldwide. It's very clear hacktivists are back and they're attacking anybody and everybody under the sun. Well, one of the problems, though, with this is that we're seeing a growth in political uh, patriotic operations. So th that as, as we've, we've been debating in the meaning of this, it's basically a political person saying something and then having hacktivists attack on a patriotic point of view, right? So basically, if the United States says, or if Russia says, hey, we don't like the United States, and I decide to attack them, that's right. more of like a patriotic thing. And that's what we're starting to see, because there's a little bit of a double standard out there right now, as far as like, hey, if Russia does say something bad about your country, I guess it's not really against the law to DDoS, and as long as it's for the greater good of the war, right? Uh, <laughs> and that's something that we've discussed on other topics, and you go back and look at it. Uh, but it is leading to the legalization of cyber arms, right? So the double standard in DDoS, we're starting to see the IT army flirting with the idea of legalizing it. We're seeing multiple countries around the world starting to mobilize and create their own IT armies, as well as uh, red team penetration uh, teams to actually secure uh, the networks for future conflicts. And that's mainly because we're seeing evolving tactics and techniques because of this Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. It's really kind of sparked a new wave of hacktivism uh, that we're starting to see a little bit more advancements, like as Pat Scott mentioned with No Name and the way that they're doing reconnaissance and launching these attacks. This is something that's very basic, but most groups don't participate, that, participate yeah. in it. Yeah, and the... Uh, and, the other thing yeah, that sorry, I wanna the other thing that I wanted to add is also the global the geopolitics that changed since the invasion of Russia into Ukraine. Um, 
all the governments are much more nervous than they were before. So it's like a cyber cold war out there, and and you see them and lines are being drawn. To, yeah, yeah, they you, you see them gearing up to protect their country, but you also see them gearing up to go on the offensive side of things. Um, and then yeah, mm -hmm. what happens with China and Taiwan, and then China and Russia. This. And this is why we say, like, de-escalation is very unlikely in the next five to ten years. And it's going to be a requirement for most companies to actually leverage threat intelligence and red team uh, engagements in order to advance themselves and be prepared and stay one step ahead or at least in lockstep uh, with the threat actors. You never want to be one step behind them, though. That's the, that's the ultimate issue there. And by using red team engagements to find your vulnerabilities and patch them ahead of time, and using threat intelligence to actually understand the threats as they're formulating the trends that are forming in the threat landscape, most companies can have a, a, a better uh, security posture because of this. So, yeah. Well, uh, we, with that, we couldn't have ended in a better note, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so. so with that well thank you very much for everyone who joined us live um, this presentation of course will stay on YouTube for a while we might cut it up in some shorter pieces um, further down the road um, all the references uh, yeah there's not that many references actually there's only one reference it's mostly the reports and the advisory on op israel that you wrote daniel so we're gonna put the links down below to those assets and um yeah if you have any further questions you know how to reach us on telegram Where yeah and also have live. the uh, newsletter coming out on the first uh, which we'll have more detailed information yeah. links to some other cyber attacks that we didn't cover this month but uh, uh if you want to see any covered next month just let us know maybe it depends on how active we the like activists it. are yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they might be keeping us busy for a while now <laughs> yeah definitely well if you're a hacktivist and you want to grow in the ranks hit a little bit harder yeah. and maybe you will be number one next month who knows <laughs> Yeah, you, you gotta get to the top of the charts if you ain't first or last. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all jokes aside, uh, it's nothing to joke yeah. about. <laughs> um, for all the organizations out there, stay safe and uh, thank you for joining us. Daniel, thank you for your input. It was great as usual. Uh, thank you for having me. See you next month. Bye. Take care. Bye.